We're going to the Gospel of Mark again. We were there last week. We're going uh, to Mark again, chapter 6. Uh, this is just the way it worked out. Uh, we're going to read verses 14 to 29. Looking at Herod. Uh, so if you get there in your device or there's a Bible in a pew near you, would you turn to Mark chapter four, Mark chapter six, and would you stand with me as we look into God's word this morning? Starting in verse fourteen, King Herod heard about this. What did he hear about? He heard about Jesus and all that he was going through, and the disciples back in verse uh, twelve, the, the disciples went out and they preached the people that they should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. Herod heard about this, for Jesus' Jesus name had become well known. Some were saying, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead, and that is why miraculous powers are at work in him. Others said he is Elijah, and still others claimed he is a prophet like one of the prophets of long ago. But when Herod heard this, he said, John, the man I beheaded has been raised from the dead. For Herod himself had given orders to have John arrested, and he had him bound and put in prison. He did this because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, whom he had married. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. So Herodias nursed a grudge against John and wanted to kill him. But she was not able to because Herod feared John and protected him, knowing him to be a righteous and holy man. When, John, when Herod heard John, he was greatly puzzled, yet he, listened, he liked listening to him. Finally, the opportunity came, the opportune time came on his birthday. Herod gave a banquet for his high officials and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. When the daughter of Herod, of Herodias, came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his dinner guests. The king said to the girl, ask me for anything you want, and I'll give it to you. And he promised her with an oath, whatever you ask, I will give you up to half my kingdom. So she went out and said to her mother, what shall I ask for? The head of John the Baptist, she answered. At once, the girl hurried into the, the king with the request. I want you to give me right now the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was greatly distressed. But because of his oath and his dinner guests, he did not want to refuse her. So he immediately sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. The man went, beheaded John in the prison and brought back to his head on a platter. He presented it to the girl, and she gave it to her mother. On hearing of this, John's disciples came, took his body, and laid them in a tomb. Father, we again look into your word, Lord, and ask that you will just reveal to us what you have for each one of us through the power and the might of your spirit, Lord God. Because we need you, and we need your your blessings upon this reading and the hearing of your word that you open our ears and our hearts to receive what you have in store for us. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. As we look at this scripture this morning and think about in our lives, people and individuals dealing with terrible sin inwardly, and even though going through the daily routines and convincing ourselves and others that everything is fine. We know it can't keep on going long because it starts eating away at us. And we look at this passage this morning of looking at King Herod. And we see, and you're going to see if you haven't seen it, if you look through the passage, that he died from the inside out. I know we talk about Christians, we look about we die on the inside, we die to self, but Herod did the opposite here. 
And we're going to look at his conscience and what drew him into the state that he ended up being in toward the end of his life and toward the end of meeting Jesus. The first thing we see in Herod's life is he has a confused conscience. We know that Herod, he made some bad decisions. He made decisions not based on what was right, but he made them based on what would bring him prestige, pleasure, and power. Herod had been Herodias. We see he was, she was the wife of Herod's brother, Philip. The early church historian Josephus helps us kind of in light of what kind of took place what his history says took place, that at one time that Herod visited Philip and Herod had an affair with his wife. And so Herodias and Herod, they ended up divorcing their spouses and became married and Herodias moved into the palace. And so John had the courage to call this relationship what it was. It was sin. And it, Herodias here, she says she wanted to kill him. It, it irked her. Her, her. Again, whenever people, again, this whole situation, whenever sin is like, aha, uh-huh, addressed, we got different relations. We have different reactions to it. Herodias wanted to kill him. But we notice that Herod protected, protected John. He feared to touch him. So Herod's struggling. He's struggling with sin. And he compromised his conscience. So he puts John in prison to silence him. One, protect him from her, but also to silence him from his criticism of his sinful practices. But also, again, he was afraid to kill John because he was, in a strange way, we see that he was attracted to John. He liked to listen to him. He, this courageous preacher, he preached the word of God, and it kind of drew Herod, he drew Herod in. There's this quote that right now we see that, that Herod, he was, we see what a great way a man would go toward grace and glory yet come short of both. We watch this transaction as as John's life and what Herod does. Because he goes from being confused in his conscience, like he hears John, and he starts to realize, you know, is there a part in his, that John speaks to him, it's like, this guy's right. But what do I do about it now? But then we come to Verses 21 to 28, where the finally the opportune time came for Herodias, her plot, trying to find a way to kill John, and it's Herod's birthday. All who were there, the society bigwigs, who was who, the who's who, were there. And it's interesting, toward the end of the banquet, when everyone had their fill of wine, Herodias sent her daughter in to entertain the guests with a dance. A lot of commentators say it's very probably an erotic dance because, okay, got, you know, he's all drunk and and all things. And so we end up with this erotic dance. And Herod's response was just like Herodias thought it would be. He offered her to give her anything she wanted, up to half of his kingdom. That's, I mean, that. That's pretty elaborate. So we see he, his, his conscience went from confused to like searing now. And if you think, my, my first thought when I hear the word sear is when you're cooking, right? And this is not a good time to think about it, but to get, get you ready for lunch. But like a steak, right? When you talk about searing the steak, you put it on and it and it. It sears both sides, become hard. The sear in the juices. Well, here we have a confused conscience, and now 
the searing of the conscience of hardening it. That it becomes, it holds in. It doesn't let in. It holds in this desire for pleasure, for power, for prestige. Because we see that the girl doesn't know what to ask for, so she asks her mom, what do I ask for? And her mom says, John the Baptist. And she comes out and she says that. And she, had, she adds in there, now and on a platter. Now, that, now here's, the, here's, here's Herod's, where's his conscience at? So he's heard John, he's heard from John, and John knows, he knows right from wrong. And now he comes to a decision on what do I do? Now it says here that because he made an oath to her, he gave her her word. But that's a cop out. Because if you look at his history and the type of oath he gave is that he had a way out because this was an immoral question. This was a moral and an immoral ask. You ask for John's head. He had every right to say no. This, well, I can't do this. But we have John the Baptist, who has been critical of leadership, has been critical of pro- he, because he's proclaiming the truth of God. Herod's conscience went from confused now to seared. Because Herod's more concerned in this because of his lust and his pride. So we see that spiritual truth would never again have an effect on him in that time in his life. Because Mark, Mark's account of Herod's life, it ends here. And we're going to look a little bit about where it picks up at. But we have to be careful about these transitions in our lives. Because our hearts can be the same way as hair, with sin in our lives. We can be confused about what's right, what's wrong, but we get in the word of God and we find out what is right and what is wrong. And the time comes for us to decide what is right and wrong. The decisions we get to make about right and wrong. Are we going to make the right decision? no matter who's in the room. Herod wasn't going to make the, Herod was not going to change his mind because look who's here. If I change my mind and stand up for John the Baptist, what will they think? He'd have been a man of honor if he would have done that. But he didn't want to do that because he thought, what would other people think? His conscience was again, starts going toward pride. It starts going toward self. And the third thing, it finally comes hardened. Over in Luke chapter 23, you go there. Luke chapter 23. So John, John the Baptist is dead. And after John the Baptist's death, Jesus starts coming on the scene. Jesus is John's disciples become Jesus' disciples. And the movement starts to move. And Jesus is moving throughout Galilee in the town, and he's healing people and, and preaching the kingdom of God. And, you know, he is. He comes to seek and to save, and, and he's preaching, and, he, and he's saving people, and he's healing people. And we just hear in Mark's gospel that, that Jesus sends out the disciples for them to go out and serve and for them to go out and, and see the power of God in them. And, and Herod sees all this, and he hears all this. And he wants to see Jesus. And Herod continues to die little by little. Do you remember the scripture said that he, re- he enjoyed listening to John? So he kind of might have had a glimpse of spiritual interest. But he allowed the impulse of the sinful area, the sinful area of his life to carry on that day, to move, to continue on. In our text this morning, 
He finally gets to meet Jesus. He finally gets to meet Jesus. He was excited. He was glad. That's what our scripture says. I'm going to read some of it to you. Verse 6. It says, On hearing this, Pilate asked if the man was a Galilean. This is a trial of Jesus. And when he heard and he learned that Jesus was under Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem. At that time, when Herod saw Jesus, he was greatly pleased because he longed for a long time. He had been waiting to see him because he changed. He wanted to see Jesus because John prophesied and spoke the truth. And now I get to see Jesus. Man, I've been waiting to see Jesus. I've been hearing all about Jesus. And I can't wait to see him. Why? Because he can get healed? Because he can turn over a new leaf? No. Because he wanted to be entertained. Scripture tells us, when Herod saw Jesus, he was greatly pleased because for a long time he had been waiting, wanting to see him. From what he had heard about, he hoped to see him perform a miracle. That's what he wanted. He wanted to see a miracle. He wanted to be entertained. He pleaded. Him with, he played him with, he plowed him with many questions, but Jesus gave him no answer. The chief priests and the teachers of the law were standing there vehemently accusing him. Then Herod and his soldiers ridiculed and mocked him. Dressing him in an elegant robe, they sent him back to Pilate. That day, Herod and Pilate became friends before they had been enemies. But we see, he goes from showing signs maybe of some spiritual interest to allowing pride of the flesh, lust of the eye, all those different things to come into him. And he got to see Jesus. And instead of asking for spiritual truth, all you want to do is see miracles. And then Jesus didn't respond. Didn't do what he wanted him to do. We have a picture of a man. He's, Herod mocked him. Him and his soldiers mocked Jesus. So we have a picture of a man who, who died from the inside out. He's gone from some interest in the truth to a man who ignored the truth to a man now who mocks the truth. That's what sin does to us. In areas of our lives, we allow it to take over and become that part that we make excuses sometimes. The longer we harbor it, the harder it is to let go. There's the areas of our lives, there, there's, it's harder to let it go because it's, it's ingrained in us. There's a, a, an Acts, uh, Acts chapter 24, 16. Paul's before Festus, and he, he wants to give an acclaim, an, an account of, of his faith. And, and he goes on here, and over in verse 16, he says, So I strive always to keep my conscience clear before God and man. Striving to keep his conscience clear. Keep a clear conscience by asking for forgiveness, and we fall short. We ask God to forgive us. Yeah, we might make the mistake again, but we ask God to forgive us. And the more we ask for forgiveness, the more we can get in that routine the more that the Holy Spirit can help us and change from the inside out. First Peter 4 3. But you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. 
They think it strange that you do not plunge with them into the same flood of dispensation and they keep abuse on you. But they will have the great give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. Christians, we get stuck in that. People might give you a hard time for doing what is right, not plunging into the behavior of others. They mock you. It's better to be mocked than to plunge into some of that stuff that others are doing because of the consequences that come about it. Because in Revelations 11, Revelations 11 uh, talks a little bit about but after the three and a half days, this is interesting, because you, you look into this, that this is uh, the, the two prophets um, in Israel that have been uh, mocked. They were mocked, and they were killed. Uh, for three and a half days, men from every tongue, tribe, and they, they gaze on their body. Uh, finished. Now they have finished their testimony, and the beast that came up from the abyss will attack them and overpower them and kill them. Their bodies will be in the streets. Uh, of the great city, uh, which is called Sodom in Egypt. So that happens. This is what comes about next. But after the three and a half days, a breath of life from God entered them, and they stood on their feet, and terror struck those who saw them. They then heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud while their enemies looked on. Now that's, again, the prophets being mocked and being killed, and then God restored them. That's prophetic. That is things that are to come and things to happen. But to understand that, for us to think about our lives today and the persecution of things that are coming our way, we see them lived out. But then in the midst of it, God's calling us have clear conscience. So if you have a confused conscience today with issues of life, God's saying my word will give you the clear conscience that you need. But if we get to that seared conscience state, then ultimately becomes a hardened conscience, then God is saying he, the openness, the, the way to receive if in the midst of a hard conscience and in an area of life is the only way to receive healing is through repentance. It's through coming to God and ask him for repentance, to repent. And what does repentance mean? It means turning around, away from. The people go, I'm going to do, you don't do a 360, right? You don't do a 360 in repentance. What do, where does 360 take you? Right back where you were. That's what happens. God's saying, no, it's a 180. It's, it's a turning away from. It's a change of mind and going away from. And that's what Herod needed to do. He didn't. So what about us today? Are there are areas in our lives that are like we're dying from the inside out. We live in for self. We live in for Christ. The pride of life. The self-esteem. Self-preservation. Whatever it might be. Of self. You get credit? Well, if we're on those ways and we're living for ourselves and we're on our way toward Herod's ex ex experience. But the good thing today, the scripture tells us, and this is not just for today, this is any time. But the scripture says in Hebrews 3.15, it says, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Herod heard his voice through John. And he continued to go in the wrong direction. In the end, he ended up mocking Jesus. Lord, help us not to do that in areas of our lives where we refuse to walk, where we refuse to turn things over to him. That we become, again, less of me, more of him but to make those decisions in spite of who's around you. Make the right choice. 
stand up for the truth, the Word of God. So that in the end, you will have a clear conscience. And it won't get seared. And it won't get hard. In those areas of life that we're struggling. Because God says, I will set you free. You repent. You hear his voice. And so this morning, as we close in song, the question is for us to examine our lives and say, Lord, I don't want to get to be like Herod. I don't want an area of my life that's going to just get hardened and just, just be something that is not going to be able to please you. It's going to be something that is, I'm struggling with, and you help me with it. So today is that day. If you hear his voice, he says, okay, right where you're at, you can come down front or right where you're at. As we're closing in song, you can just ask for forgiveness. It can be that simple to say, Father, forgive me. Lord, I just need your forgiveness in this area of my life. Help me not be hard in this, but to soften, to receive what you have. Amen? Amen. We're so thankful, Father, for that faithfulness, that in the times that we are unfaithful, you are still faithful, and you call us to today to go with hearts and understandings of knowing that you are waiting for us to have repentant hearts, and then to go in the direction you call us to go. We go with your peace and your grace that passes all understanding in Jesus' name.